As a product of the two legendary icons, former President Nelson Mandela and freedom fighter Winnie Madikizela Mandela, their granddaughter Zoleka is inspired by their passion to bring about change. But this passion came after a long line of challenging life's lessons, addiction, love loss and death. I'm here at the Tokosan Hotel in Monte Cassino to chat to Ms. Zoleka Mandela about life, her book and how hope whispered to her. Fully committed to her role as a mother, breast cancer survivor, and road safety activist, Zuleka Mandela's life is a story she believes will change many lives. The unexpected and tragic loss of two of her children, Zanani and Zanawi Mandela, surpassed her early breast cancer diagnosis, catapulting her from a journey of pain and struggle to hope, faith, and inspiration. When I reached out to you on Twitter, you replied saying, thank you for hearing the voice that I thought I never had. When did you realize that you had that voice? Um, I realized I had a voice uh, shortly after my, my book was published. Um, I think with that came along the kind of impact that I felt um, a lot of, I was making a lot of people's lives uh, with the feedback that I was receiving and you know the kind of support and I think just you know having people write to me every day or um, call me to say listen your book has changed my life and you know because honestly when the book came out I was very afraid I was quite petrified because I didn't know what, how the world would react to the book or how the reader would react to the book. So my first initial uh, feeling was they're not going to understand it for what it is. But, you know, I, I realize now that, you know, it obviously has had such an impact. You were brutally honest in your book about your addiction, about everything. Uh, what was the intention behind that and, and, and what was the outcome? You know, the whole honesty thing is I've never, I've never always been on an honest person. Um, you know, um, struggling with addiction to cocaine and alcohol. Um, you know, I've, I've, it, for the first time it feels so liberating to be so honest, despite how brutal it is. I mean, it is a very difficult pill to swallow, I think. Um, you know, even with some of my family members, they find it very difficult to read the book. Um, I know in particular my grandmother who is struggling right now just even reading past chapter one because she's just you know so amazed and shocked and I think very hurt at how much I've had to go, uh, go through you know with her being in my life so. In the book you refer to your lovers using horoscope signs <laughs> what was behind that? You know as, as much as my my past relationships were a part of my life this book is about my life and it's my story and the the last thing I was going to do was name and bash because that's not what I'm about but you know so I had to you know out of respect I think use the pseudonames um, and the star signs by the way are they real star signs <laughs> Beautiful. so yeah. it just worked out for me in the end you mentioned that after the death of your daughter you went back to the roadside for I suppose closure mm. how important would that be for somebody who's been in that position um, I obviously can't speak for a lot of people, but I'm, I'm hoping that in telling my story it gives um, a voice to so many other people because at the end of the day, you know, the whole point of When Hope, Hope Whispers for me was to say to people that, you know, my story is your story and, you know, there's nothing that I've gone through really that is a novelty. And uh, for me, it, it, it really was, it, it did come as a shock um, for, for my counselor to say, listen, you, you actually have a sexual addiction. And although I don't go into detail about it in my book, but to, you know, have to take myself into rehab, you know, two months after my daughter passed away for something I struggled with for over 10 years, the mm. cocaine and the alcohol, and to discover that, you know, I had an addictive personality to so many things, um, I think was, was, was quite, um, it came as quite a shock to me. And, and I think so brutally so that I had to actually look at myself and, and, um, and realized that, you know, I had been such a desperate person and somebody who was so emotionally unstable. So it was always easier to look to other things as a source of comfort mm. to try and numb the pain, whether it's the, the, the sex with the men or the addiction to, you know, cocaine or alcohol. Um, I mean, I did grab a bottle mm. uh, after my daughter passed away. It only took me about two months only after two months after my daughter passed away that I checked myself into rehab and I had really reached rock bottom and to be honest if I'm going to be brutally honest with myself I, I had reached rock bottom a very long time ago and for me people always ask me so when do you, did you 
finally realized that you wanted a change and you needed to change, you yeah. know. And for me, it came those 10 days before I lost my daughter because I had tried to kill myself. I had mm. attempted suicide after indulging in cocaine and, and, and alcohol again. And at that point, you know, I had tried to burn myself alive with my kids in the next bedroom. Zanani Mandela celebrated her 13th birthday on the 9th of June, 2010. Just two days later, returning home from the FIFA World Cup kickoff concert in Soweto, she was killed in a car crash by a drunk driver. I don't, I don't think there was uh, necessary, uh, necess well, necessarily any closure to my daughter's passing. I don't think there'll, there'll ever be that moment for me where I say, you know, I've finally accepted that my daughter's passed away. But um, I think what keeps me going is not that I've dealt with the passing, but that I continue to celebrate what I feel is her memory. Mm. And, and for me, that is, you know, being a better parent because I wasn't a better parent to her for those 13 years. She deserved a better mo mother. My son deserved a better mother. And I wasn't able to do that um, and up until I took myself into rehab. So I just, you know, I do that. I try and celebrate her memory and trying to um, improve my mothering skills, trying to be a better mother. The campaign that you started, let's talk about that. The campaign was um, launched in, in memory of my daughter's passing, um, in memory of my daughter, uh, who was very passionate about kids. So, um, you know, it, it really is, 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 is a way in which I can make a contribution to road safety. So I've been fortunate enough that I've been supported and backed by you know, the likes of the FIA Foundation and the Make Roads campaign, where we're able to come together and to support the missions of the uh, Decade of Action for Road Safety, where we're trying to decrease the number of road deaths, in particular with our kids, at least by 50% in the year 2020. So it's, it's really just been great to get that support and to feel like, you know, I'm finally doing something and I know something that my daughter will be very proud yeah. of. You originally weren't going to do the chemo. What changed your mind? I think it was really out of fear. Um, and I wasn't too sure what it meant to, to receive chemotherapy treatment. And, and I was in denial for, for, and it took me about, I think, three months, actually, um, to finally agree to receiving treatment. But um, I'm really glad I did that um, because I, I, I believe now in saving myself, saving my life and being there for my son and my family that I'm able to save so many other lives. You were incredibly, incredibly precise from day one of chemo to the end of what you went through, how you were feeling, what you were taking, why you were taking it. Why did you opt for that and what was the decision behind it? And that's exactly why I, was, I did that. I chose to do that was because I really wanted to take everybody through my journey with breast cancer. Um, and, and really because I really did believe that at the end of the day I would survive it. Um, as difficult as that seemed at that time, initially, um, you know, being diagnosed with breast cancer. But, um, you know, I started recording it. I started writing down everything and I started recording it on my iPad. And unfortunately, you know, the, the documentary that I was working on is still um, something that I have to work on and not necessarily anything that's been aired at the moment. But I, I'm just happy that people were able to kind of get insight into how it is that I dealt with my chemo. and. And most importantly that, you know, Zalega's here now and, you know, there's life after uh, breast cancer. You're an incredibly beautiful woman and I saw a clip about the day when your hair was taken off and you found difficulty in, in, in seeing your beauty. How did you overcome that? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize how much my hair defined me. Um, and now I just see it as an accessory. Um, I'm, I'm into wearing wigs now. I actually look forward to like throwing, tossing my wig to the side as soon as I get home. But, um, you know, it, 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 it really was such a turning point in my life because I was realizing just how I attached myself to so many things that were just so immaterial. Um, and that had nothing to do really with who Zolega was. I remember, you know, coming home and my hair is falling off. And, um, you know, this was two weeks after I had begun my first chemotherapy treatment and my hair is falling off and my partner comes upstairs and he sees my hair and I remember how that experience alone um, made it all the more easier for me to deal with. And I remember my partner and I and my son laughing at the fact that my hair was looking so bad. 
So, you know, it, 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 it was something that I felt I needed to share with my readers as well, that, they, you know, there's, there's a funnier side to chemotherapy as well. I didn't realize just how attached I was and how I've let a human hair define me. <laughs> I feel so ugly right now and hence the makeup on my face right now. I'll be okay. A word of inspiration to somebody who's starting their first day of chemotherapy, whether it's breast cancer or any form of cancer, what would you say to them? I would say that um, not necessarily just about the chemo, but I think something that I always say um, in closing off in every talk that I give is that uh, my grandparents, fortunately, um, have taught me, um, you know, amongst any other thing, that it, it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from or what you've done, that you will always have the power in you to change yourself and to change the life of somebody else. And so I always say that and I'm a big, big, big um, a believer in the fact that you can always change your own life story. She envisions the awareness of breast cancer and road safety as by no means an obstacle on a road to extending her project work in South Africa, but merely as preparation on her personal journey to counteract the lives lost due to road carnage and breast cancer. In sharing her story, she hopes that her life will inspire people to follow many of their dreams, despite life's frequent ebbs and expected flows.